Students, faculty, parents, and families, honored guests, welcome to the commencement ceremony for the class of 2020 at Providence Classical Christian Academy. Today, we are overjoyed to recognize the achievements of the five seniors graduating this year and invite you to join us in this day of celebration. We've been forced to wait two extra months for this day, but may it be that the extra waiting makes the celebration all the more tremendous. And now may God pour out his blessing upon our exercises today, and may he be pleased with our celebration. O Heavenly Father, be exalted this day as we reflect the exalted Christ, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forevermore. Amen. Please be seated. I now welcome uh, to the stage our headmaster, Mr. Chris Buckles, uh, for the presentation of our awards. Good afternoon, everyone. So glad to be here together in person for this graduation ceremony. Each year, we present awards to our upperclassmen recognizing the students who have demonstrated faithfulness in their academic studies by completing the entirety of their 7th through 12th grade education in Providence. The Restorer of the Ruins Award is given to graduating seniors who have attended Providence from 7th through 12th grade. This year, all five of our graduating seniors will be receiving this award. So I'll call each of your names and Mr. Keating will hand you your Restorer of the Ruins Award. Daniel Bosch, Sam Hatfield, Cameron Haverdick, David Hinsky, and Michael Warner. At this point, we would also like to recognize a student who spent her 7th through 11th grade years, as well as 3rd grade and on up to the upper school, uh, but was able to join them for this senior year. Kate Stoner has been an important and valued member of this class in the eyes of her teachers and fellow students. So we wish to recognize her at this time as well. Please join me as we congratulate Kate Stoner and the rest of her class as well for their time here at Providence. Upper School Capstone Awards are given to juniors or seniors who embody our mission to equip students for a life of wisdom, virtue, and eloquence to the glory of God. Each of the Capstone Awards is tied to a specific part of our vision. Thus, there is an award in wisdom, an award in virtue, and an award in eloquence. The Lewis Award is given to a student that demonstrates exemplary wisdom as displayed in their academic work. This award is named after C.S. Lewis, the 20th century educator and writer. Lewis was an apologist for the gospel whose clever wit, creative thought, and scholastic rigor have served to make him one of the most well-respected Christians of the 20th century. Lewis demonstrated that when you approach questions with academic seriousness, you can earn an audience with both Christians and non-Christians alike. This student has demonstrated wisdom in his academic work through his commitment to learning new things, as well as his willingness to ask hard questions, but sincere questions about the things he has come to know and believe. He demonstrated consistent discipline in completing his work while showing a love for the endeavor of learning. This year's winner of the Lewis Award in Wisdom is Cameron Haverdick. The Elliott Award is given to a student that demonstrates exemplary virtue as displayed in their Christian character and service. This award is named for 
Elizabeth Elliot. Elliot uh, was a 20th century missionary and writer. She was called to serve as a missionary with a remote tribe in South America during the 1950s. While serving, her husband Jim was killed by the tribe they were seeking to evangelize. Despite losing her husband, Elliot returned to serve as a missionary with that tribe for two years. Elliot's missionary service and later writing career emphasized the power of a life of virtue, formed and shaped by the message of the gospel. The student that we are going to recognize today, who has demonstrated virtue as a consistent model of character and service, demonstrated integrity both inside and outside of the classroom, and in his commitment to pursue virtue even when such pursuit is difficult and costly. And the winner of the Elliott Award of Virtue this year is Daniel Bosch. The Churchill Award is given to a student that demonstrates exemplary eloquence as displayed in their leadership. This award is named for Winston Churchill, the 20th century statesman and writer. Churchill served as Prime Minister of Great Britain during the dark and challenging days of the Second World War. Churchill's leadership and resolve were a model for the British public as they endured early defeats and near constant air raids. Churchill's articulate speeches and radio broadcasts provided hope and helped turn the tide in the war. This student has served in several leadership capacities, using his positions of leadership for the service of his classmates and the wider school community. His willingness to take responsibility and follow through on commitments are hallmarks of true leadership. This year's winner of the Churchill Award in Eloquence is Will Widler. So we wouldn't typically distribute these awards during graduation ceremonies. These are usually part of our evening of excellence that would typically have happened in the month of April. And so we're thankful that we were able to have this time to present those awards to our students. It is now my honor to welcome to the podium our salutatorian and valedictorian for 2020. Both of these students in their own way exemplify the wisdom, virtue, and eloquence with which we strive to equip our students. They have taken up many roles of student leadership in and for the school. We are grateful for their years of service here and the investment they have made in the school and will be an enduring testament to their care for Providence. I now call forward our salutatorian, Cameron Haverding, then to be followed by our valedictorian, Daniel Bosch, to present their addresses. It's hard to believe this day has finally come on multiple levels. First off, that we have completed the first major stage of our lives, and second off, that we as a class are able to celebrate this achievement in light of the pandemic. Reflecting on my time at Providence, there have been many challenges that come with such a small school. I have struggled with the small class sizes, limited sporting opportunities, and the less ability to make a lot of friends. However, during such reflection, I have also come to realize how deep the relationships I've built have been, something I'm extremely grateful for, as well as the benefits of a school like this. Some of those benefits include the personalized attention and care that the teachers give, the fact that they want you to succeed and learn, and the emphasis being not only on education, but also on becoming the best person you can be. They're also given many opportunities that those at other schools might not receive, such as the Europe trip, the upper school, but uh, upper school retreats. I'll always cherish those memories as well as my memories on the basketball court. I'd also like to thank a few people who have helped me along the way throughout high school. First off, I'd like to thank my parents for always encouraging me to do the best I can in everything that I took on, for supporting me during my highs and my lows. I'd also like to thank my teachers for expending so much effort to give me and my classmates such a quality education and worldview. In particular, I would like to thank Mr. Buckles for his patience, especially during our class's younger years, Mr. Keating for his individual focus on us as more than just students, but as people, Ms. Brewer for helping our class with so much more than just writing, and Mr. Matul for his wisdom and people. 
Finally, I would like to thank my coaches throughout the years. First off, Coach McCarthy for coaching us through a rebuilding year, teaching, teaching us both the fundamentals of basketball and also how to be better men. Next, Coach Marcotte for never giving up on us and giving us the locker room motivation and key moments. Finally, Coach Keaton for sacrificing so much to be able to coach us and giving me the best post defense he's got. <laughs> Although I do not have time to thank everyone individually who has impacted me along the way, I know that you are really appreciated. I'd like to end this by exhorting you all to recognize that we only have one chance to live our lives, that we might live meaningful, impactful lives, doing all for the glory of God.
I have huge respect for all four of you, and I pray for God's continued work in your lives. This graduation ceremony may put a more satisfying end to our time at Providence than lunch at Costco did, but I hope it is not the end of seeking wisdom, virtue, and eloquence. Providence's mission statement is to equip us toward these ideals, but there will come a time when we must seek them on our own, without classmates, without teachers, and even without parents. It is important, therefore, that we keep Christ at the forefront of our journey, as his love for us and his word is always constant. As we leave the shelter of providence, the world will try to undermine our values, even feed us corrupted versions. But in Christ, we have hope that our quest is not in vain. As Paul writes in Romans, yet in all these things, we are more than conquer conquerors through him who loved us. Thank you. speeches and words of thanks, and I'm honored uh, that they have asked me to be their commencement speaker this year. Uh, as they mentioned, we had many years together in the classroom. I remember actually my first year of Providence uh, was when these guys were in sixth grade. Uh, they had an interesting second semester. I believe Mrs. Cuffew was out for that semester for her uh, maternity leave, and they had different teachers cycling through. And I remember sometimes there would be a little gap between a teacher leaving and the teacher arriving. And I would sometimes think I'd hear some funny noises coming from the room, and then I'd see David's head poke out. <laughs> and I'd poke back in. I'd be like, maybe I should uh, just check on those guys real quick. <laughs> uh, and then the following year, they entered the upper school. And uh, actually, I had them in the classroom for four years in a row. Because I, for a while, taught seventh through ninth grade. And then the year they were advancing to 10th grade, my 9th grade class, I swapped it out for a 10th grade class. And so I moved up with them. And uh, so honestly, if they cannot write to this day, I am to blame. <laughs> <laughs> but I appreciate your kind words, and we have so many memories that I look back on so fondly. And uh, I, I won't take too much more time sharing those memories, but uh, it's fun to think about. It's amazing that we are here now at this day of graduation. But the bottom line is, I've had the privilege to see these young men through their upper school years. And I've had many opportunities to challenge them to grow in ways that, you know, maybe they weren't naturally inclined to challenge, to be challenged to grow. And my hope now is in this commencement address to, is to give you one more challenge before you guys go on to the next season. To give you some encouragement as well, but as you enter into this uh, next stage of life, uh, you will be faced with many challenges. And so I hope the challenges you face here will make those challenges all the easier to approach. I'm going to begin by actually reading a couple of passages of scripture that I'll be referring to through this address, a few different parables. The first one I'm going to read is from Matthew 13, verses 31 through 33, it is the parable of the mustard seed and uh, the leaven, and it's where Jesus is comparing these things to the kingdom of God, saying the kingdom of God is like. And many times that was how he was opening up a lot of these messages. And it reads like this. The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour, till it all was leavened. In addition to that, I'm going to read from Matthew 25, verses 13 through 30, which is the parable of the talents that many of us may be familiar with. And it goes like this. For it will be like a man going on a journey, again talking about the kingdom of heaven, what it will be like. It will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went 
and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also, who had the two talents, came forward, saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward, saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you scattered no seed, so I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown, and gather where I have scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him, and give it to him who has ten talents, for to everyone who has will be will more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away, and cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness, in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So there are a few parables that may be seemingly unrelated, and I'm going to refer to them in a moment, but before I do, I want to address some of the challenges of our day, some of the difficulties, some of the trials that happen to be right here before us. And what's interesting is, in some sense, there's nothing new under the sun. A lot of the things that we face today are things that have been faced in generations past. But there are also unique things about the day and age that we happen to live in. There's a few things I want to point out that I'm certainly not going to try to attempt to point out every single challenge that exists in our modern world. But one thing uh, that we have here before us is the temptation, you could say. Uh, it's very common to become, quote unquote, an influencer. Right? We see these influencers, they're on YouTube, they're on Twitter, they're on you know, whatever kind of social media platform. And much of what's used to measure their influence or their impact is how many followers they have, how many views they've had, maybe a particular thing that's been put in front of everybody. And this is an interesting metric to be used to measure influence. There's also this strong pull, not just to you know, gain followers on something like social media, but maybe to become famous or to become an entertainer or an athlete. These people are considered influencers as well, or simply to grow wealthy or powerful in business. All of these different ways that people can garner power and influence. And indeed, much good could be done in such a position, right? We see the appeal there and see, you know, if I had this influence, if I could have this broad reach out to all of these people, there's maybe much good that could be done through it. And I believe there is potential there. But it's important to remember this is actually the calling of very few. There are very few who are actually called to those positions, and only those who have already fortified their own character and virtue can endure the pressures of being faithful in such a position. It's especially hard, it's especially challenging to remain faithful and not compromise. The opposite end of this, right, when we hear this kind of pressure to become this big influencer on a pedestal, the opposite might be to simply flee and say, I can't take that kind of pressure, that kind of responsibility. Rather, I'm going to go and hide. I'm going to bury myself somewhere where I don't have to accept responsibility like that. These expectations placed upon us may cause us to give up before we start, resigning ourselves to failure, just to feel as if we've had a say in the matter, maybe made a choice. Now, we don't want to do this either. The added challenge that we have is we're in the midst of a pandemic, of course. None of us have forgotten that. Uh, we're all sitting here wearing masks as we attend our graduation ceremony. In particular, we find ourselves in this unique age that's not only in the midst of a pandemic, but as we all very well know, all kinds of different social and political ills that surround us, all kinds of divisiveness and difficulties. We're trying to reconcile all the many problems that we have in the world. These circumstances further push us to either take initiative to try and be agents of change, or to try and be leaders through a time that, you know, many of us have many questions, how do we operate well during a pandemic? Or simply to check out, right? That's the other temptation, to say, well, it's, it's just too much for me to handle. I'm just going to back off and let somebody else handle it. 
And how to act in these times, though, right? If we're not going to check out, if we are going to act, it can feel like it requires more wisdom than we have. Say, I don't know how to do this. So much of what's happening, it feels like there's no precedent for it. We spent all these years reading these old books about what's come before us, and we feel like what we're facing now is nothing like what's come before us. But you'll be surprised at what these books and what scripture has to say that can give us principles that can help us. And what seems so overwhelming actually can be greatly simplified. So back to the parables. First, let's consider the mustard seed. The mustard seed, as well as many other parables of Jesus involving seeds, urges us to find the right conditions for healthy growth. If you think about the seed and the sower, the seeds were all planted in different conditions, and only one of those seeds grew healthily. It was not choked out. Lord willing, your education in Providence has not only been the planting of many seeds, but also very good conditions for growth for you so far. And much of that has been done for you. Seeds are being planted, you're held accountable, and you are surrounded by people who are promoting good growth in you. But from here now, it's up to you to continue cultivating good conditions around yourself to keep growing, to keep reading, to keep learning, to keep depending upon the Lord. You're going to find less and less. Are there necessarily going to be people thrust into your life who are challenging you to do these things? And so it's going to be very important that you take the initiative on that from here. And as it says in the parable, and I'll get to this idea a little bit more later, it says that when the mustard seed has grown into this tree, it's larger than all the garden plants, and the birds of the year may come and nest in its branches. It's strong, it's sturdy, it's hospitable, it's able to give comfort and safety and life. And that's what we hope for you guys, that you will grow to be strong and be offerers of life. The leaven, we consider the leaven, the leaven reminds us that the greatest influence actually often starts with a small concentration of the right thing, which then grows beyond all imagining. See, both with the leaven and the mustard seed, the growth doesn't necessarily happen because any human was able to make something grow. We can't make something grow. If you want a plant to grow, you can try and create the right conditions, but it's the Lord who gives the growth, very much as the Apostle Paul conveys when he says, I planted Apollos water, but it was God who gave the growth. And it's likewise in the leaven. It's interesting, we're not necessarily called to make worldwide impacts, but rather to be faithful with the small things. Trusting that it's God that will bless and expand these small acts of faithfulness into world-changing acts. The small things you do to bring God glory will multiply and actually have cosmic impacts that you never could have imagined and that you may never even see in your own lifetime. Many times we get so obsessed with doing something that we're going to be able to see in our own lives, having this massive worldwide impact and this legacy. But oftentimes what we're really called to do actually is to be faithful in these small things and the fruit that will be born in that small faithfulness will actually be born far beyond our time. And finally, the talents. I want to encourage you guys to be bold and to be courageous with what God has given you to manage. And God's going to give each of you guys different resources, different opportunities, different skills, different blessings to manage for his kingdom. And whatever it is that he gives you to manage, you ought to be bold with it, not bury it. Being a good steward with opportunities, abilities, and resources we're given in this world means investing them. It means oftentimes even taking a risk. You think of the guy with the five talents and the two talents, they took a risk to invest those and receive something back. So God may entrust you with much. God may entrust you with little. But either way, he's calling you to use what he's entrusted to you to build his kingdom. So whether that be much, whether that be little, the calling is the same. The call to build the kingdom requires being faithful and trusting God's hand. Those are the things I want you guys to remember from this talk. Be faithful. And trust God's hand to bless that faithfulness. If you happen to gain a major platform in the future, maybe some of you will. Be one of these major influencers that we see. Your calling will still be to remain faithful. Even though the pressures of the world will be pressing on you from all sides to compromise. But trust God 
and stand firm. If it's not your calling to be one of these high pedestal influencers, if you happen to live a very humble life, a very small circle of people surrounding you, your calling is to remain faithful and steadfast, even though you may wonder if you're really making a difference. The truth is, you may be making more of a difference than you think, and you may never get to see again the fruit of that difference. But that does not mean you're not in the right place. In order to be men who will change the world, I want to call you guys to be builders. Bring glory to God by starting with the small opportunities that lie before you. Steward them well and see what else God may give you to cultivate. Maybe it will continue to be little. Praise God for the simplicity of life. Maybe it will be much. And praise God for the honor of leading and continue to lean on him to give you the strength to lead well. The truth is, I want to encourage you guys, a humble life can have much more cosmic impact than you might think. This reminds me of in Robinson Crusoe at the beginning. Any students who have been in my seventh grade literature class know when we read Robinson Crusoe, we talked about the advice his father gave him at the beginning. He says, Robinson, don't seek after wealth, don't seek after riches. Rather, seek contentment. Seek a humble and good life. And then we know Crusoe does not follow his father's advice and ends up being shipwrecked, and the Lord meets him there. But I want to give you guys that same exhortation that Robinson Crusoe's father gave him. Don't seek the glory and the riches of this world. Rather, seek a humble and content life. That is good. And as you invest in the lives of the family that you were born into, who are here celebrating you today, as you invest in the church, by which, Lord willing, you will continue to be a member of and contribute to in the coming years. As you continue to invest in close friends and new friends that you will make in the next season of life. As you continue to invest in a household that you may build one day, even with a wife and children. The deposits you make in the lives of those people that you are in contact with will go on to impact people you will never meet and touch a day that you will never see. Faithfulness is trusting that God will bless the stewardship, service, and sacrifice you rendered to him for his glory, even if you never see the fruit of it yourself. Remember what the author of Ecclesiastes emphasizes. He says life is fleeting. We all have our lot. Life is full of all kinds of struggles, and though there is much strife, we are wise to find joy in the small pleasures of our toil and the treasures that God gives us to steward and to manage well for his glory. So I want to give you three kind of more specific statements here at the end, kind of applications, if you will. First, as I've said this, but I want to say it this way, steward well what God entrusts to you, even if there's a bailout on the horizon. When God has given you an opportunity, when God has given you resources, when God has given you talents, Use them well, even if you know that managing them poorly won't necessarily result in a bad consequence, even if you know you're going to kind of be bailed out in the end. Because managing relationships, resources, opportunities is not necessarily about the result, actually. It's about practicing faithfulness. So I want to encourage you guys to practice faithfulness, even if you have this feeling that, well, if I'm not faithful with this, if I'm not careful with this, I'll actually still be okay. It's about building that good habit. Second, live an upright life of integrity and service, even if nobody recognizes it or praises you for it. We don't live upright lives of integrity and service for the praise that we will garner from other men. Rather, doing the right thing is not actually about even inspiring others or the good consequences that follow. Those are good things. If good consequences follow and others are inspired to emulate you. But rather, again, it is about being faithful. Doing the right thing simply because it's the right thing. And third, fight the good fight, even if the mission is doomed to fail from the start. We tend to think, well, why would I go into a battle if I'm doomed to lose? But if it's the right thing, if you're fighting for that which is good and that which is worthy of being defended, even if you know you're going to lose, it is still the right thing to go in. Sacrificially defending what is good is not necessarily knowing you will win in the end. Again, it is about being faithful. So I keep saying that, be faithful. 
be faithful? Well, how do I do that? What does that actually look like? So practically, I want to say this. Being faithful is growing in what we call piety. In other words, well-ordered loves and fears. So first, we know we ought to love and to fear God. It says, we ought to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then the fear of God is the beginning of knowledge. That's where it starts. God comes first. Second, love your neighbor, even if your neighbor is your enemy. Because elsewhere in Scripture, we are called to love our enemies. And finally, do not fear man. Love and fear God. Love your neighbor, but do not fear man. Do not be overly concerned with the opinion of man. Certainly don't be concerned with the opinion of any man above that which is the opinion of God. And this follows the call of the greatest commandments. So through faithfulness, I want to encourage you guys to build something with your life. And what you build doesn't have to be big, but it does have to be sturdy so that others can continue to build on top of it. And that what you have built will be the beginning of whatever God is going to do with what this is your life. Invest in a few people intimately and personally, knowing that the Lord will bless as the leaven and the mustard seed. Don't be like the man who buried his talent and be willing to take some risks for the kingdom of God. And I think all of this can be summed up in the passage from Matthew, in Matthew 6.33, where it says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Your education has been about preparing you to be citizens of God's kingdom and ones who build up God's kingdom through faithfulness. So every day, I want to encourage you to ask yourself, how can I be faithful with what is right before me, great or small? And pray that the Lord will guide you with each step. Thank you. the hymn 
building a little flock as a benediction and charge to our seniors. While we are unable to have our usual choral performance, we are pleased to have an instrumental performance uh, from Catherine and Daniel Bosch. The lyrics are printed on the insert in the program so that you may read along as they perform.
I charge you to do these things for God's glory and not your own. No nobis domine domine, said to a glorium. After I give the benediction, there will be a recessional after which all are dismissed. Graduates will gather outside uh, for our traditional uh, front of the school sign picture. It's a little warmer this year than it is normally, uh, but we're still going to do it. So uh, we'll gather outside for our uh, traditional picture. Faculty will be out there as well. We'll do a picture with the uh, now alums and uh, our faculty. So you're welcome to join us out there. We we'll just take some pictures as well. After that point, you're, dis you're uh, free uh, to, to be dismissed, obviously, on your way out. If you didn't already have a chance to glance at the tables that are set up next door with memories from each of the students, you're welcome to do so again. Now let's conclude with this benediction. Students, faculty, special guests, please stand to receive the benediction. Heavenly Father, we ask for your mighty hand to be upon all those who graduate today. Bless their lives with your presence. May you embolden them with your love and power. As your Son, Jesus Christ, has sent us all into the world to preach the gospel of his kingdom, confirm in them this mission, and help them to live the good news we proclaim through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. <laughs>